going to be really, they were actually, we're supposed to sit behind a table and stand behind the podium. And we're trying to get closer to you. So if you want to get a little bit, that would be great too. Feel free to move forward if that would work. So about two minutes and we'll get started. I recently left the Gates Foundation in order to launch the ACT Foundation for ACT. And yes, it's the assessment company, the data insights company of ACT, SAT, ACT. Um, ACT has been around for over 50 years, and, uh, and it's set up as a nonprofit public trust. So any funds above operational cost go back into the public. So this will be the first year, um, towards the end of the year, that the dollars that are beyond operating income will be strategically invested back into society to sure to ensure academic and workplace success. So what I'm doing here is welcoming you to this session where we hope to make a compelling case for competency-based learning. And especially from a student's perspective, that means bringing meaningful and practical balance to the work and learning spheres of their lives. So very quickly, I just wanted to hear what comes to your mind as you think about competency-based learning. You've been hearing a lot about it here lately, but is anybody brave enough to tell me? Yeah, sure. Achieving a certain level of understanding on a defined set of objectives. I think that's pretty well, pretty well put. What is the difference between traditional education and competency-based education? Does anybody want to try that? Uh, be able Will those it was him in the back. And, and that's exactly right. So when you achieve a certain level of a competency, means that important. Let me try to switch. Okay. Let me give shot. Is that better now? Okay. So that was exactly right regarding the time to this. So one other thing, when you're achieving a competence performance, so what we're so just taking an example, how many So when we think of measuring typing, what do we usually use? How, d how do you know? Speed and accuracy. There's two things, there's two pieces to that equation. Speed and accuracy. Accuracy being really, really important. If you ask my son how many words per minute you can type, he's like, I can do a And I'm like, 180? Huh, that's fast a test and let's just see. Let's, let's assess your speed and your accuracy. He couldn't do 180. He did about 100. His, his accuracy, though, was 50%. Yeah. 
<laughs> but he was really proud until my husband got on there. It became a family competition. My husband jumped in, and he's like, well, let me do God. Has 30 words with six errors. She's younger. And then it was my turn. I got to go last, being the mom. And I was able to do 80 words a minute, approximately. It was 79. But I had six errors. But we were able to quantify both the speed, the level of competency through measuring the Hello? There. Okay, maybe we have it then. So that's a really easy model as far as being able to figure out how, how competent somebody is in typing. But then you get to another example. On a team, what role do you generally play when being a member of a team? What I want you to do is just this is this is going to be this is what you have written for me <laughs> um, hello okay so, so the podium all right So what I want you to do is just grab a partner next to you, or if you're at a table where you're not, Letty Lee could turn around or something. Just grab somebody next to you. What I just want you to think, just reflect on this question for a minute. When you're on a team, what role do you generally play? Why? And think of an example. Just take two minutes to reflect on that. You didn't know it was going to be a, <laughs> a test with this. Take one more minute. Thirty more seconds. Okay, five, four, three, two, and one. So who wants to go first? We're done. So on a team, what role do you generally play? Why? And just give one example. Any volunteers? OK. I'm going to try this. Making it difficult being in the middle of the room, but that's OK. OK, my name is Brett Wood uh, from Rose State College uh, outside of Oklahoma City. 
and um, the role that I usually take is, I guess, that of a leader, or maybe by default, because other people don't want to stand up and speak like this <laughs> and summarize, and my example would be right now that I'm standing up and speaking <laughs> for the group. That was really good. Okay, who wants to go next? Especially if you have a different role that might be jumping to mind. Oh, up front. All right, my name is Gary. I'm from Muskegon, Michigan. Um, I've been married 25 years, and I view my wife and I as a team. <laughs> um, and the role I generally take is whatever role is necessary to make sure World War III does not break out. <laughs> my example is uh, my mother-in-law is at the house for Christmas at dinner. And in that environment, my most effective strategy and my effect most effective use of my time was to stand in the kitchen, do dishes, and not say a word. <laughs> <laughs> so, so, Gary, how would you sum that up? That's as a, what kind of role would you say that? A one-word description. I'm a floater. <laughs> <laughs> a joker? Did you say joker? Oh, floater. Okay, I got it. Anybody else? One last example. Uh, I'm <laughs> so is it Steve or Steve? Steve. Uh, hi, I'm Steve. I'm from Klamath Falls, Oregon, uh, Klamath Community College. Um, <coughs> basically, uh, what we talked about was... Uh, um, I said I was probably like a support position, and she said, well, if you were a football player, what would you be? I said, probably either a, a tight end or a fullback, because sometimes you have to run the route, sometimes you have to stay in block, sometimes you have to take the handoff and, and run downfield, so um, so that's probably what, what I do is, you know, much like you, probably a floater, whatever needs to be done, some sort of a support position, so. Great, that was, if everybody could just give them a hand. So that, that exercise was meant to be fun, but it was really meant to describe what a lot of times in the employment situation, what employers will use in an interview to learn whether a person can truly perform, and if they can, if they say they can, how they do it and whether they've really done it in the past. But it's the same thing that happens in competency-based education. You take the learning. The example here is um, my daughter's studying Egyptian stuff right now. They had to live like Egyptians in the house. They had to eat like Egyptians. They had to wear clothes like Egyptians and go to school. They had to perform like an Egyptian for one week. This is proficiency-based education, competency-based education, and they did have to finally pass the assessment. So how does that apply today? Well, Pam, Cherie, Debbie, and Rhonda are here to talk about a certification that has actually been around for over a decade that is a base-level certification that applies to everyday life that lattices into STEM careers, humanities careers, journalism careers, and is also accepted by employers as a means for promotion, for wage gains, and for moving ahead in the workplace. It's a balanced approach to making this work. So then it becomes, how do you actually do this? So I'm gonna set the stage real quickly, and I'm gonna read to you a bunch of different facts, just kind of list them out. So nearly 14.8 million people are employed in retail trade, about 10% of the labor force. The most common occupations are what? Cashiers, salespeople, you probably get students all the time into your colleges that are coming in with these types of occupations. In fact, as I was kind of doing the research for this, um, what I read, uh, according to Retail Wire, 
was that more than 63% of Gen Y workers, more than 63% have a bachelor's degree but are working in jobs that don't require a college degree, particularly retail. That's almost sad when you read that statistic. And you wonder why that doesn't make sense, especially when we know it's the second fastest growing job in the labor market. We know that there's lots of other jobs out there. Why is it that 63% with bachelor's degree would be working in retail? Sure, we have a slow economy, but there's a lot of jobs that need to be filled. Second, the retail industry's demographic makeup is similar to that of the US workforce as a whole. Slightly younger, the typical person being around the age of 38, women and minorities in most of the cases with the national median hourly wage being around $10.80. So the hard reality is actually not that great. Most jobs, and not only, to top it off, most jobs are part-time and just in time. And unions play a very minor role, so the quality of job isn't always number one. And I think the most staggering piece of information is what I've already mentioned, that the correlation between more education and the pay doesn't add up. So that sounds like a very bleak space to be working in. This uh, number one thing that I hear from at least a lot of educators is that we can't count on employers. We, they tell us what they need and then they don't hire them. When they hire them, they don't bring them in at a level that's appropriate and then promote them. Employers don't care as to whether the students get educated, that they have access to the resources or tutors that they need. But I found, after meeting with the Western Association of Food Chains, Sheree Phipps, right here in the middle, raise your hand real quick or stand up, this is one sector out of the retail trade sector, and this program that they're gonna talk to you about has been around for over 10 years now. And very few people actually know about this program. I was shocked when I came upon it a couple years ago. It was like, really? You all have been around and been doing this? Why is it that a 30 credit hour certificate can actually have more impact than a degree? What is it about that certificate that has any impact or efficacy associated to it, especially for a student? And that's what we're gonna talk about today, is the compelling case for competency-based education. How, why does it become compelling? So the four people that we have here are Sheree Phipps with the Western Association of Food Chains. We have Rhonda here, who is a prior student in the program, uh, so has completed the program and is pursuing further education. Then we have Debbie with Tyler College in Texas, who is getting ready to launch this programming. And then we have Pam with Clackamas, who's been doing this for what, six years now, over six years? And, and amazingly, how they're doing that programming in order to benefit their student population. It's what we're gonna talk about today. So this is meant to be a dialogue and not a presentation. And so because of that, I've asked everybody to come out to the front so that you can see them and so that they can interact. This is, this is a <laughs> yeah, <laughs> some of them are short, so they're gonna have to stand. So what I'm hoping is, is that this will be more like a, an interview type of of session and that you get a chance to ask your questions, OK? 
okay? So help guide this whole process so that we get the questions answered that you need to have answered about this. So first thing I'm gonna do is just talk to Cherie here real quickly. Um, the w Western Association of Food Chains has been around for how long? Well, we're going into our 92nd year as an association. 92nd year. When did the education uh, division start up at WAFC? The retail management certificate program has been around for going on 13 years now. Prior to that, the only program that was available to, or that we were sponsoring, is a program at USC that's very small and very exclusive, uh, and that's going into its 54th year. So who is a part of WAFC? Well, it's, it's made up of the presidents of many of the major grocery chains across the US, as well as regional and uh, smaller, even mom and pop type grocery chains and wholesalers that supply groceries to the smaller companies as well. Or, okay, in fact, we have a, um, it goes from A to, Z, A to W. So, you know, Albertsons and Safeway and Costco and um, Kroger, all the companies that are Kroger, Fred Meyer and Food for Less, et cetera, even Whole Foods and some of you from the Northwest would know Winco. So a, a huge group of employers. All of the names that you see here and then some, ha their presidents serve on our board of directors. And how does the education piece fit in with all of that? Is it the same presidents that help guide how this certificate is developed? How do you get to the details of what competencies are required? Well, the way we began establishing the certificate was to work with the store level people that were pursuing the store management title. And the person who runs a grocery store in this, in this industry, even looking at, at that entire list, can make somewhere between, anywhere, between $55,000 and $100,000 a year with the bonus related to their store. So that seems, and that seems to be the spot when you're, you hire somebody to bag groceries and they start working up the ladder, they get to the store director level, and then the funnel gets really small. So at the store director level, uh, at the store director level, uh, we start looking at what are the competencies that get you to that level. To be successful as a store director, what does that look like? And so this pyramid that you see here, we, about five years ago, this is, you know, long ago we, es we established the retail management certificate. We found it around the competencies for success at the store director level. And then we heard about this retail competency model that was up on the Department of Labor's website. And we sort of attached it to what we were doing to try to compare and determine whether or not the competencies we had used 13 years ago to establish our certificate were uh, in line. And it turns out that they're very close. You can't see the detail on this, but many of you being in the education side of the house know at the foundational level, we're talking about developmental skills. We're talking about some foundational academic competencies as well as some workplace competencies. And then you get into some industry-wide competencies as well. And the courses that you see on the right, if you can even read those, um, at a foundational level, things like business writing and communication skills, um, computer skills, some basic math, um, and some accounting, those would be foundational skills that, uh, that you could really quantify. And we were able to do that back in you know, 13 years ago by working with an industrial psychologist that came alongside employees working in these positions and working on the career path up to that store director to determine what things really matter to be successful at that level. So why is it that you actually started with community colleges and not with other education providers? Well, the grocery industry, um, and you know, you talked about how much, you know, $10 an hour is the average wage for a retail worker. I really feel like the grocery industry is in a special niche within the uh, retail sector. Uh, the grocery industry typically pays a little bit better when you hit that top end, but still, the average wage for that person, as Parminder mentioned, is low enough, and when you're trying to reach into the trenches and bring people up along a career path, and they're working and trying to learn as they go, they can't afford. They can't afford uh, private universities. They can't afford uh, the for-profit universities. And we really wanted 
for the primary, the primary purpose was to make sure that it was something that was accessible and affordable. But accessibility has another um, strain to it. You're looking at, we wanted, the, the WAFC represents 14 western states. And all of those companies you saw there, they've got stores all over uh, the US. And we wanted to make sure that employees had access to the classes wherever they lived. When we started doing the program 13 years ago, it was very rare for any of our employees to be interested in taking the courses online. And so it was important that they had a brick, or, brick and mortar campus close enough to them that they could access. So affordability and accessibility. And then you get into the things, transferability. They get, they get transferred a lot from store to store and maybe they move far enough away that they need to be able to take the skills or the, the courses with them to another community college that's already a partner with us and has the program available there so they don't lose any of their uh, units. So when you started over 13 years ago, where did you actually start first in those? Can you go back? When you started with those states, where did you actually start first? We started in California, in Southern California. I was actually working inside one of the grocery chains. I started out bagging groceries, um, along with about 90% of the rest of the people in the grocery industry. It's a very homegrown, reach them up by the, by the bootstraps and, and continue them on a path. Southern California, uh, I was working on this for my own company and I reached out to two other companies uh, in Southern California, major companies. So between the three of the companies, we had about 70,000 workers that we were gonna be able to help access this program. So we put our heads together, we got the community colleges from the whole state of California, a representative group from economic development regions throughout the state to work with us and created a curriculum committee that looked at those competencies and matched it up with course outcomes and learning outcomes on what we would call off the shelf courses so that we could ramp this up quickly and not have a lot of colleges say, are you kidding? Developing five new classes, we just that we won't do that. So there was two reasons that this was such an interesting model. Number one, what we've learned from Harry, the Higher Education Research Institute that everybody submits all of their first time, full time freshman data to, what we learned from there that was that over 60% of students have some type of retail experience during their higher education learning. So what happens to that piece of it? What happens to everything that's experienced and learned in that environment? That becomes an issue because students not only are trying to make a living, they're also trying to work and move ahead. How does that get counted? That, beca that becomes an important issue as we try working towards completion and better lives for people. The second one I can't remember all of a sudden, but <laughs> there were two reasons and I'll jump back into it. So as this program started progressing, it was back in 2006 or so that Clackamas began getting interested in this program, but it wasn't a total switch overnight, was it? Yep, you're gonna need the mic. <laughs> this is Pam, can you hear me? Yes. Yes. So I actually was at Target Corporation as part of the advisory committee when the Retail Management Certificate came to Oregon. So we, not only did they have a national advisory committee, but we had a local one. And we were, um, it's a different, different, part of the re different part of the retail industry, but uh, everyone was really clamoring to get the best and the brightest of people as we are, everyone is doing in all industries. So this was very exciting to Target and the folks in, the, in that industry. So I had worked really closely with the academic folks as an advocate from the industry side to get this going uh, with the, with the um, I was gonna say Joan Ryan, she's not here, but she really navigated it. The exciting part about Oregon is not only did they do the certificate, but they did it statewide. So every community college in the state of Oregon provides the certificate, and it's 100% transferable between institutions. Um, so that was very exciting for us. Um, 
So it took you how long to actually convert over to the certificate? Because colleges are always calling to try to to try to become a part of this and get endorsed by WAFC, but it doesn't always work that way, from what I understand. So it took you two years to transition into this curriculum? Correct. It took us two years to get the correct curriculum translated over. And, and then, of course, we needed to work with industry to make sure that it was a good fit for them as well. So we, we have um, major employers, Kroger and Albertsons and Safeway and, and yeah. Ray's in our state. I know I'm missing the question. So for the students, no, that's perfect. But for the students, you know, for the students who have to navigate the system, right. they end up with 30 credit hours out of the retail management certificate. Is that right? Oh, are you OK? Yeah. Um, yes. They end up with 30 credit hours. How does that lattice into? Any science, technology, engineering, math, how does this pathway work? So for us in the state of Oregon, we have about a 17% of the students that take the retail management certificate with their company. So we do a lot of work where we deliver it at the company site versus them coming into the college. And about 17% of them then take additional classes, like Rhonda, and maybe Rhonda could speak to this better, to, and, and pursue additional education. Okay, so as far as the transferability of this certificate, there's also the reason that you get promotions and the way that you move up through the company. It's associated because why? Why is it that this certificate is so powerful? Well, let me hit the big word. It's competency. So the certificate really d are the courses and the learning outcomes and the competencies that people need to be successful within the grocery and the, uh, the retail industry. So that's why it's significant. If I have this education, then I have the additional pieces to be able to do my job. You know, I start as a clerk, well, all of a sudden now I need, you know, business math so I can do the fractions and I can start putting up the sales sheets and, and being able to do that. Kind of so when you look at these courses, at least when I look at these courses, business math is business math. Business math is business math. Business writing is business writing. It, business writing is business writing. All of those are traditional classes that measure the competencies in retail management. And the beauty of that is they're all BA. For us, they're all BA classes. So they will actually help people start from being a clerk, taking business math so I can be on the sales team to actually being able to work all the way through their MBA because it transfers all the way through. So how is this any different than what was already being done? Community colleges already offer these classes. The, the difference is that it's actually aligned with what needs to be taught at the right time in someone's career where people can take it as they career in and out. And also that we didn't decide it as, as colleges. You know, it, really industry came and said this is what we want. This is the, the way we would like to have it taught, and the reason is that we want to keep more of our own people and grow them. So how is that going to work as far as in Texas, the vision that you have there? I feel so fortunate. I am, well, on the map there. You saw that Texas, we're a recent addition to this program. I'm the only community college in Texas that offers this program. And this is our first year. We actually have implemented it. Uh, I feel very fortunate. Our path to this program was different from some others. We have a major uh, grocery retailer. It's the third largest employer in our, our region. And they came to us, president to president, came to our institution and said, we need your help. We, we know about this program. We think it would benefit our employees. And can you get it going? Will you offer it for our program, or for our employees? And president to president, they were in total agreement. But we're not presidents, are we? So it had to come down to an operational level. I was very fortunate that I'm on the curriculum and instruction committee at my college, so that I was able to ram it through, uh, if you will. But the advantage to being able to, this happened in January. And I had that program up and running in August, and I had 114 people enrolled. And so it was a great start. But it, it all hinged on that employer uh, 
link and a high level commitment from both our institution and the employer because it allowed me to overcome some institutional barriers to fast track uh, the implementation. I didn't have to wait two years. We also pulled off the shelf courses. Uh, the good thing about this program is there are competencies established by the industry. We only have to match about 70 to 80 percent of those. So it means that every now and then my course can be a little different from someone else's or my course can have a different name or title to it. And of course in Texas we're always different, right? And, and, but the core competencies that that student will exit that, that course with are comparable to what you can get in Oregon or any other of the, the 14 states. So for us, it was that strong industry connection and top, man, uh, top support. Let me just say, all of you may have had kind of workforce programs and you have an eager partner and then do they kind of it lose traction over time. We had gone through a full cycle with this, this uh, employer where for years they tried to do their own training through their own private sources and they came back to the community college because we could just offer it in, in a wider range of formats that helped theirs. And they are, they are multi-regional, so online is huge for some of their employees as well. So how does this result in for, from the student's perspective? How do you, you also, you Rhonda, you went through the program and now you're actually pursuing higher education from what I understand, and you're working, right? I work, I work, I work approximately 60 hours a week um, and I cover four states. Um, I cover 35,000 employees. There are six of us in our department for training. So I do work hard, I travel a lot and the, the ease of the program is that a lot of it's online I do get the classroom portion. Um, I'm missing class tonight, <laughs> but it was for a good reason. Um, it's just one of those things that um, it's, it's really easy to um, be able to um, take one class at a time. I know that most of our industry, if you, if you were in one of our training programs, and I said, how many of you have more than 10 years? And everyone will raise their hand. I have 32 years in. And we'll say, how many of you start off bagging groceries? Okay. How many of you um, came to work to go to school? You came to work so you could afford to go to college when you're 16, 17, 18 years old. All their hands will still be up. So how many of you planned to be in this job back then? How many of you wanted this as a career? And every, everyone hand will go down. No one plans to stay with the grocery industry, but once they get in, they have fun, they enjoy the work. Um, they, and most of our people, you, you look at the experience that we have, we have people with 30, 40, uh, 45 years today in one of our um, classes that has experience but had no education. And so they're all going back and looking that in today's industry, today's world, we need to have that education as well as the experience. And that's why we have such a large group of people, 35 and older, going to school, including myself. But if they you know, just take that one class, that's all I challenge them. I'm in charge of education for our company. And I just challenge them to do that one class. And once they take that class and they can see it is doable and, and they're, they get over that fear of going back to school, I started when I was over 40 years old with the two month old. And I thought I got the job with my company to go to school and never did. And it was a goal I had in my life. And at you know, 40 years old, new baby, that's something I always wanted to do, and I took that challenge for my company. And they challenged me to go to school, move up in the company, do something different. And so um, it is something that there's so many of us out there that are doing that in the retail industry and grocery. They're taking that challenge, going back to school. Uh, one of my store managers that signed up is in his late 60s. Mm -hmm. And he's almost finished with it. And he has a real estate license, he has other things that he's done in his life, but this is the one that really matters most to him. So we have, I, I, I think I see it change in our industry. I see in it making it better, um, uh, just improving our efficiencies at the store, our knowledge, the understanding of the whole picture, not just my little job, what I do in training, but how does my training affect the whole company and how do I contribute? And that's what we're learning by these classes. 
Thanks, Rhonda. So as far as from one of the big major themes that comes out in here is the need for remediation and accelerated learning. How do we get that and yet allow students to be able to take whatever they've learned in the workforce, keep applying it, and finally earn credit for it as they move through that pathway? That's, I guess, the beauty of this program so far that I've understood with over 500 graduates that are completers that have come out of this program over the years, taking, what, six years on the average to two years to complete. Yeah. Can you talk a little bit about that? Sure. Um, it takes, you, most of the people that pursue the certificate, like Rhonda, were people that got into the job for, you know, it was going to be a money job to put gas in the tank, and the next thing you know, 10 years later, they're full time, but they haven't figured out that this is now their career path. So when they start taking the classes, they're already working at least 40 hours a week, and she really does work 60 hours. So it takes, on average, two years for them to complete the 10 semester long courses, or quarter long courses. Um, but we do have some that take four or five years and some that can accelerate it by taking two or three a semester and completing in one. And then we also have people that have prior units and then they never finished their school and we definitely want them to come back, have their transcripts evaluated, waive a few of the courses and can move them along more quickly. Even people with four-year degrees that want to come back and get this certificate because theirs was in some unrelated area and now retail is their focus. And our industry has made this so important from a top-down standpoint that they want to, to get it, even though they already have a degree. Thanks. So I've seen a couple <coughs> people starting to raise hands. And I think we should start taking a couple questions as we're going along. So I thought I had seen, oh, was it you? I'm sorry. Sure, thank you. Uh, how do you address the gap with online courses and perhaps the competencies to do that and, and help? Uh, do, you, do you assess uh, a work, you know, an employee to say, or, you know, or, or you, do you have the baseline skills? If not, how do you close those? Um, we do have hybrid classes. Um, so it's where you meet once a week and then you do all your assignments online. So tonight I, I should be meeting. <laughs> Um, it's actually till 8.30, so I'll probably catch the end of it. And it's at our corporate office, so the college does come to us as well. Um, so that the hybrid allows me to be there and get that instruction and have that face-to-face, -face, as well as the online, where I can get up at 2 o'clock in the morning and do my assignment, because that's what I like to do. <laughs> Just from our standpoint, we do struggle with the, some of the competencies, especially with computer skills for the online. So. Because they register through our college, they have all the access to the tutoring and the computer labs and anything else a student would have. So we really take extra advising time to let them know what kind of resources they have. And then we usually put some leeway in the beginning of the course so that if they're not successful, then we can let them do the, the computer remediation. And we do get emails. I get an email maybe every week, every week and a half, encouraging me to So that they are sending me emails, even though it's an on, you know partial online class. Do you need help with the writing assignment? Come in, and we're here from this time to this time. Um, you know, come in and to our writing workshop. And so they are offering other support as well. Um, <coughs> earlier on in the session, we were defining competency base, and we talked about the function of time, and, and if someone could demonstrate that, for example, they had those writing skills or those business math skills then they wouldn't have to necessarily go through a, a long course. Is, is that built into your certification where, where students that? Right. So oh, I've got this, this one. Um, it will be. Um, we're, we're really excited that uh, this model has become so popular with the Department of Labor that they awarded us a $12 million TAA grant to be able to expand it and enhance it and revalidate the competencies. So this week we are meeting with uh, Western Governors University, who is a partner in this, and who, you know, their competency-based education is time. It's been, you know, what ten years or more that they've been doing it. So they're helping us revalidate the competencies, and then it's tossed over to our curriculum folks to repackage and work with the courses, which either one of you could certainly answer better than me. And then 
to move in that direction. Well, now I'm really excited because that's a <laughs> that got me going because I think that's the really big win is how can we create our uh, curriculum so it's competency based so people can assess through. So one of two things you can either use it for credit for prior learning by assessment by having these these competencies, not learning outcomes, competencies made put into your curriculum. So one thing that, that we're going to be doing in Oregon is actually uh, redoing our curriculum with faculty advisors. So if you're excited about this, let me know because we're taking input from all kinds of places to actually redesign the curriculum and then make it online. So and it'll have lots of learning objects and be engaging. Um, but that we do a lot of work with veterans. I don't know if you have any veteran friendly schools here, but we see so many people coming out of the military or coming out of industry, and they have 90% of the stuff, but they don't have the theory. And so they still need to come back to be able to get the credit that then's transferable. So we're pretty excited about the possibilities of that. Uh, can I just make one comment? I, I think we all understand the value of competency-based and, and you know skills assessment. I think from some of us, um, we have tried to compress courses so that people can advance through it quicker. We do a lot of eight-week classes, 12-week classes versus, you know, the traditional 16 weeks so that they can kind of stack them and pack them and focus on one course at a time. One of the roadblocks we really have to competency-based is even if we have a mechanism for advancing them based on their skills, not making them go through every unit just because it's a requirement of the course if they already have the knowledge and skills for those first six units. Uh, institutional practices such as when are grades posted, when could they get it transcripted, there are still so many institutional barriers, barriers as we move forward in true competency-based education. Here, here. Okay. <laughs> well, and that was my question too. Are you guys looking at doing like a rolling, rolling in um, registration and because um, we're interested in that, but we're coming up against those system-wide. Um, Western Governors is a little bit different model because they pay for time. So you That's pay right. A, it's you, pay for time. Right. So you pay a set amount for six months, and you can take as many classes during that six months. You can have to register for another one as you as you go through. So as we're moving this way, does anybody talk to their registrar's registrar's office? Mine freak out every time I talk to them. So <laughs> the mine, mine did too when I first came, and now they're just used to me. So <laughs> so we're doing some tests and some spanning classes. So we're not able to break all the rules, right? We'd like to, but we can't. So we're actually having our classes like start in September and end in May. So the students don't necessarily get their grading when it happens, but we're, then we're able to at, oh, actually open our section so people can open entry, open exit. Uh, we still have the, the fiscal year end. I haven't been able to work around, but we're trying to do things through a really old lumbering organization. So, so I love the model and I'm Leticia Barajas from Trade Tech College. You know, we differentiate course versus competency. We actually think they are complete opposites. So I'm interested in figuring out whether you're, are you thinking this 30 unit as a college, are you considering really moving towards true assessment at the competency level, then rethinking how you package that 30 unit? because. Right now, what I'm hearing is it's still it's a competency base, but it's still go via a course, a traditional course model. Uh, so for people like Rhonda, who have years of experience, she could have technically, she might have, it's likely she had multiple competencies that she still has to miss class for, but we're still requiring it. So I'm interested in knowing in Oregon how how fast or you know when do you expect that? Because that's the I think a million dollar that's question. The, that's I'd like to say we're really progressive, but we're not. You know, we we have old traditional systems. So, for us in Oregon to modularize a course by competency, where you could test through a course and not necessarily take the whole course, maybe only six of the ten competencies, will be earth-shattering for us. Mm -hmm. The good news, however, is that this curriculum will be developed on Department of Labor dollars, so it is going to be out there and available for those of you that are have more capacity for that and can start sharing those stories back with us. 
I, I just wanted to ask you to elaborate a little bit more on the differences between the learning outcomes and uh, competencies, because you seem to have stressed that. So a lot of times we do our curriculum, our traditional curriculum, um, some based on how the publishers put books together, and it's integrated through the course. So we have all these things webbed together, so it's not clearly competency-based. So it might be my learning outcome is whatever is in chapter one and two, but it's not clearly tied to workplace competencies. And I don't know who I'm talking to, but I, I hope that answered that question. Yeah. So I think it would be um, sad if we missed this piece of it. What I did want to show here, moving this along on the competencies that we're trying to get to where it is, where they're trying to get to, where you can pace it out at your own place. The one piece that um, is happening is, is the WGU relationship, which will allow that to happen in a quicker manner. But I think key is that the curriculum is available so that anybody, any entity can pick it up and turn it into a true competency-based curriculum. In Texas, because it's new, there's going to be, from what I understand, an opportunity to get there quicker. Whereas in Oregon, where this has been happening for quite a while now, it's harder to make that change quicker. This competency model, when you line it up to other careers that are fast growing, like healthcare or manufacturing or energy, this is actually the base to their advanced programs of study. In, in those fields. So what's happening at the national level now is that this competency model leading to the credential of the retail management certificate takes the 30 credit hours and you can use those, apply those credit hours directly to a course of study in manufacturing or energy or in one of the engineering fields. So it's starting to advance it. There's a, there's, um, Programs in Sinc at Sinclair that are doing this at Valencia Community College that have been able to start lining up these programs. So I think that's a key that that is going to be helpful as we start moving the conversation forward. Are there any other questions on the accelerated learning portion of this? Or just general questions at this point? So why don't we move into the next topic as far as the benefits that are derived from, for the student. One of the major reasons that um, this, this model has been of interest is because, because it aligns directly to the career pathway side of this when you start looking at here's the education pathway, Here's the competencies that are needed right in the middle, and here is the career pathway that lines up to the competencies. Sheree, do you want to get into this and explain this piece of it? Sure. Uh, we, we made sure that uh, our courses were aligned with our competencies, which I mentioned earlier were coincidentally exactly the same as the retail competency model. Um, so on the left, you see a red and a yellow bar. That's probably all you can see up on this overhead. But within that are the list of our generic course titles. So the same ones we talked about earlier, some foundational skills ones and some soft skills. And as you, if you come across to the other side, the red and yellow bar correspond with a linear career path, which is pretty much what happens in the retail industry when you start out. You start out at the bottom bagging groceries, you work into a cashier, stalker type position, or maybe you move into a department and you become a department head of a deli bakery. Maybe you come back on, onto the grocery side and now you're going to be a first level supervisor. So in that red bar, you cover all those lower level positions while you're starting out taking the classes. This is in, an idea, in a perfect world. And then as you move up the ladder and you see the yellow section, the yellow section is that sup first line supervisor level and up into the store director position. This is the, where the money is. This is where people who are working in the store just kind of checking out groceries and not thinking about their future need someone to help them have that light bulb go on. Showing them an education pathway that's linked to a career that has a job 
with family sustaining wages well beyond 100,000 a year connected to it. And that's why our industry over the last few years has really ramped up in um, is seeing people take advantage of it because we are now able to show visually, even though the program's been out there for 13 years, but we weren't saying, hey, the reason you should do this is it's aligned with the competencies that lead to success. We want you to do it so that you can get to that store director level and beyond. We have people at the CEO level from the past who've got uh, no college education, making you know $500,000 a year or more. But, but and they're going back to school. The president of several divisions of, the, of our companies are going back to earn this certificate because it was never laid out for them this way. And the light bulb's going on for them, too. Does that help? Yeah, it does. So when, what happens in the workplace as you get this certificate? Well, our industry is really behind this. And when you look at um, each of the company presidents talking it up and sending letters to their employees, prepaying tuition if they'll pursue these 10 classes, and then encouraging them to go on. But when they earn these 10, when they complete these 10 classes, not only do they get the college certificate, but they get an industry credential that is endorsed by the WAFC as well as their own company. So it's got their company logo. And when the president says, this is what I want you to do, that's the certificate they want even more than the college certificate. Beyond that, they get a cash honorarium from the WAFC. And most of the companies have paid the tuition support reimbursement for them or up front as they've gone on. And then statistically, without us pushing, 60% of the people that pursue this certificate halfway to an AA go on to get the AA or four-year degree, and even some onto their master's, 60%, which is far more than we ever anticipated and certainly higher than the statistic I think Parminder mentioned at the beginning. Pam, can you add your personal comments to that? Well, our the way our company looks at it is in the, you know, when it first started off about 10, 11 years ago when our company really got into it, um, it, was, it was something that was there to help the individual. Now we're pretty much requiring anyone that's going to move up into management, we're looking for a degree, at least an AA. And this retail management certificate gets you halfway there. You get, you know, halfway through. We're prepaying for books and tuition for a management member to go through it. For non-management, we pay for the tuition, and we reimburse the books at the end of the 10 classes. So the company's saying, we will support you, um, but we want to see what, you know, what you want to do. Because not everyone wants to move up in management, but if you want to, that's what they want. They want to see that that person move up. They want to see them go for that education. And it is in our interview process. What are you doing for your education in order to move up into this next position? And so now it's, it's becoming a requirement. And for the first time since I've been doing this for a few years, um, we're starting with career day. And I'm supposed to go out and let them know that this is if you plan on moving up, this is the way to go. This is what they're going to expect. They want them to move forward, get an AA, and to get a bachelor's because they know in order for us to be here, you know, companies are falling by the wayside. Um, in order for us to be here, we need to have educated um, people in our industry in order to be here 10, 20, 30 years from now. Well, I'm just curious. So how about the East Coast? It sounds like you're just, you know, limited to. <laughs> well, you saw, you saw the map of the 14 Western states, and that is the WAFC. In the Western half of the US, the grocery industry is much more collaborative in personality and by nature. In the East Coast, they don't even get into the same room for any reason. And, and I know there's, a, there's a lot to that. But whenever we do collaborate, we have to have an attorney in the room so that there's no price fixing and things like that. You know, so your eggs don't go up to $5 a, uh, for a 12-pack in, in because everybody's doing it, that kind of thing. So it's a challenge. But um, we have, uh, it, as, as part of the grant over the next three years, the goal will be to take it national. It is available nationally through um, two community colleges, Cerritos College, which is based in California, and Umpqua Community College up in Oregon because of things they've done with their Board of Regents to make it so. Uh, but we want it to be available nationally to everyone. And as I think Pam and Debbie both mentioned, that 
It will be available through the open source repository for all the community colleges in the nation. It will be accessible to, gro to grocery companies who want to use the modules for individual training. And then that will be something that ties back for prior learning at the companies as well. We're also, the, the goal is to take it national uh, to the entire retail sector. And so one of our um, subcontractors in the grant is Corporate Voices for Working Families and Peg Walton. Who's at the back? So it will eventually get there. And, and if you are on the East Coast and you want to start now, we're happy to start working with you. I've got lots of colleges in, um, in, in the East Coast that have called me at, because their employer read about this in a periodical for our industry and said, we want this too. So. Anybody else? So how does it work then, like Kroger is in Ohio and on the so in the South, how does it work for their employees with this credential? Well, you, do you want to speak to that? Or um, do Dave to Valentine, that kind of efforts at the corporate office? Oh, you want to go for that part? All right. <laughs> well, they, because, because the presidents of these major grocery chains serve on our board of directors, there's a, a reach all the way back to Cincinnati where uh, corporate headquarters is for Kroger. And they're hearing about the program and all of the Western US companies that they have are really firing on all cylinders to make this program important. Kroger has embraced it in a huge way by division. And so when the East Coast starts hearing about it, when all the presidents get together, then they want to know, why don't we have this too? And that's where this national reach really started, was trying to get a college like Cerritos. We had Clackamas on board at one time with that as well to be able to offer it across the nation. Because they recognize the competency-based education is making a difference in the West. The presidents are talking it up and really showing the value of it. Interesting. So um, I'll, I'll come back to you. There's one other question real quickly. Um, when a college, you know, when you read the name of the courses along the competency models, every college already has those courses. So if a college were to take those 10 courses, just lump them together and say, hey, Cherie or Western Association of Food Chains or Kroger or Food for Less or whomever it is, um, can that suffice for the credential? It, How does that work? It can. We just want to evaluate. We want to do the crosswalk. <laughs> Letitia's been through it most recently. Yeah, we, we, um, we take the WAFC uses a generic set of course outcomes for each of the courses, and we ask the, com the colleges that are coming on board to do a crosswalk and compare their course outcomes to the generic group. And then as long as they have 70% or more of those course outcomes for that class, then, and they package it just this way, then they will be endorsed by the uh, retail, or by the uh, food industry, and we will add them to our website, and we will start marketing them, and they'll help make materials so we can send it out to all the stores in their areas and really make a big deal of it. Letty. I know you're, you're trying to get that, that question, but one of the things I really wanted to mention is that at Price Tag, I was optimistic. I said, woo, we have this already. But when we drilled down to that, I recognized, and it, was, it took a third party industry validated partner to tell me, no, you're not necessarily quite there. You may want to tweak it a bit. And that has been a significant support at our institution because now the department chair knows, oh, goodness, what I've historically been doing is not necessarily what industry wants, even though you know they've had advisory committees on their own. So it's not as – the beauty of it is that there is that validation process. And I think uh, for us it's been invaluable. I mean, that, that in and of itself has been – uh, something that we can report on our Perkins report is something that we are doing a lot of alignment with. But it's not just the packaging. So I caution you to think, like I did uh, in August, oh, we've got it. We can just get it set and go. Uh, they're really drilling down and doing that due due. Um, and mine isn't really a question either. It's um, following up with Cherie. We've been involved at our, our college with Cherie for I don't know, seven or eight years, yeah. I think, um, in Skagit Valley College in Washington. Um, as a faculty member and department chair, another service I think about that Shuri offers is twice a year um, we meet, all of us who offer the retail certificate in Washington State at one of our colleges. It's the faculty, it's the department chairs, it's presidents of grocery stores, it's representatives from the, um, the food, the WAFC, I always get the name wrong, 
Um, so it's a great, it's an all day thing. One of the grocery stores provide lunch and we spend the day working on, on different things. And it's just a nice way to get together with um, industry people and other faculty members around the state. It, it, they are really robust meetings and they're very important to us. In the states where we have, I mean, I'm one person and I've been trying to do this for 14 states and when I get to a certain area and suddenly I just can't fit that advisory meeting in, that state starts to fall apart. Both the retailers and the colleges get their attention sent off in another direction and so I believe they're one of the most critical pieces to this. Even if it's just to get together to say, are we still on the same page and moving in the right direction? But the brainstorming and the invaluable ideas that come from those. So if you're in, in any of those states, let me know and we'll add you to the list. And there tends to be a competition between the grocery stores on who can make the best lunch. So <laughs> <laughs> they raise the bar a little bit. I think every time we eat, there's a OK, are there any other questions? Okay, well, what we hoped to get through on this session was this case for competency-based learning. Um, as you can tell from this, we've started drilling down, or I keep saying we, it's they. They've started drilling down into the competencies and moving it to the, the one step that takes the time out of it is a very hard step to get there. But they're working on it. And I would say probably in the next, what, 12 months? Actually, I think it's going to be quicker with, with that since the competency meetings are yeah. tomorrow. <laughs> in the next 12 months or so, there should be a way to get through this curriculum without having to be bound by time. So things are happening at different levels, um, you know, different, but I think what's really amazing about this is that it, there's results. We always have a lack of evidence when we move forward in order to say that based on competencies, things will work. And, and I think at least if nothing else, there is evidence here and it's publicly available. Just have to contact them. Okay, thank you. Thank, come on up and you can talk to the experts.